Well, God bless you on uh, this great Father's Day. It is also traditionally uh, the third weekend of June. It's also Juneteenth. And uh, Juneteenth, it has been, yes, an important historic uh, day in the, in the experience of, uh, as Elaine Brown calls us, lost Africans here on the continent uh, of what is called America. And Juneteenth reminds us uh, that liberation and freedom uh, for our uh, folks who have been enslaved uh, did have an end date on it. Somebody say amen. Uh, at least in the context of our current American empire and, and country that uh, on June 19th, 1865, the uh, announcement of the abolition of slavery in the uh, U.S. Uh, began to kind of uh, make its way all across the world and, and certainly, or at least the country. And uh, certainly um, it started, I think, out in Texas and, and it took a while to get all the way uh, news to spread, right? And it just helps to remind us that uh, sometimes uh, a truth can be uh, declared, but it may take you a little while to catch up to the truth. Somebody say amen, right? Like, you know, I, I often say that uh, you know, slavery was not abolished uh, in 1865. Slavery was abolished by God in eternity. And it just took about a couple hundred years for America to catch up. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? And uh, even after it was announced on June 19th, uh, the reason why we have watch night or New Year's Eve service is because folks were trying to figure out man, is this really going to happen in June 1st? Are we really going to be able to acknowledge and realize that we are free? And so Juneteenth, it is one of the, the most important days in the life and the calendar of uh, African people, particularly here in the United States. And there are all kind of Juneteenth celebrations happening throughout the Bay Area. One is happening today in Berkeley, uh, in the south side of, of town on Adeline. And so if you want to head on over there after our service, uh, in about an hour or so, they're going to have stages and games and food and fun. And you'll get a chance to get a little bit of that Juneteenth love and Juneteenth history in your bones. I'm so blessed as well this week because uh, one of the big <clears throat> initiatives that I used to advocate for when I was uh, in the White House consistently was reparations. I used to sit in meetings uh, with uh, the Obama administration and uh, I was the only person in the room asking about reparations. So much so that one of the staffers told me, they said, Pastor Mike, if this president or the administration talks about reparations before he leaves office, we gonna create a bust with your picture and frame on it and put it in the White House. Cause don't nobody talk about reparations the way you do every time you in a meeting. Now, of course, uh, they didn't talk about it, so I guess that was my one chance to get my picture and bust in the White House. Uh, but on this Wednesday, I'm so excited uh, because a number of folks that we're in relationship with have been working on uh, bringing reparations back into a political and policy conversation. And it will be the first ever hearing that will happen at Congress on Wednesday on uh, the issue of reparations. Representative, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee is uh, chairing this hearing and myself and a number of others are going to be there and we are so excited because Danny Glover and Ta-Nehisi Coates and a number of, of us are going to be there bearing witness and testifying about the importance of bringing a conversation and policy around reparations. Amen. And so, you know, it's happening on June 19th, which is, you know, should not be lost upon us. Amen. That uh, on, on the day when uh, slavery was abolished, we are now at least starting to try to have a conversation around HR 40, which is a commission to study how reparations can be delivered to all of those who are direct descendants and whatnot of enslaved Africans in uh, the United States. And, and I don't know about you, but uh, we owe some reparations. Somebody say amen. And uh, I think that may hasten uh, the, and accelerate the ways in which 
our country continues to struggle with the ways uh, of our history, uh, both with African people, indigenous folks, and others. I think we still have a long way to go to atone for some of those sins as a country. And uh, we who are here that are part of the lineage of that great suffering, I hope that we realize that we should allow the country to do reparations for us and our families. Amen. I, I talk to folk all the time and be like, oh, we don't need no reparations. I'd be like, yes, we do. Amen. And, and, and if you don't want reparations, just put it in account and give it to your child. Somebody say amen, because they're going to need it. <laughs> mm. So anyhow, uh, a, great, a great time for us on Father's Day and, and during this week to, to remember the journey by which we have come. Uh, turn your attention to the scriptures then, the lectionary passage for today, Romans chapter number five. Uh, I found and I do find it to be a wonderful uh, expression and declaration for all of us who are fathers and who are attempting to live into the act of fathering. On Mother's Day, we talked about mothering and how mothering uh, is a divine uh, attribution and commitment of God uh, in the world. And I want to continue this theme of what does it mean then for us to take fathering as a divine gift, fathering as another expression of God's great love to all of creation. Uh, often we uh, over associate the word father with God in the, in the way, in a sense, uh, where we begin to think that God is a male. And uh, the reality is God is not male or female. God is a spirit. <clears throat> God is beyond our kind of gender identities and, and categories. But, but it is always important to appreciate that because God is beyond us, uh, anytime we describe God, we are always diminishing God in some kind of way. Yet it is necessary to describe God or else we could never fully understand God. And so all of our knowledge about God is always and at every point of our life a, 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 a journey to full discovery. Uh, uh, even our theological, systematic theological precepts and revelations and, and, and doctrines, they are always testifying in part. Amen. They, 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 they are not fully exhaustive of, of, of who God is. Uh, it, it is just a, a, a picture. I, I, it's old, I don't remember if I learned, someone told me this while I was over in the continent. Um, but, but it sounds like I, I, I learned it there because I don't know where else I would hear it. But they were saying, you know, uh, trying to describe God is like you being in the pit with an elephant. And, and, and as you are positioned on all sides of the elephant, you, one is holding the trunk and another holding the tail and the other is holding the, the, the foot. And it's like, okay, describe to me what this elephant is like. And depending on where you're situated in that pit with the elephant, man, the elephant will be described in many kinds of ways. But you need a full picture or at least a full uh, appreciation or at least uh, uh, sitting with all of the different voices in the pit who are holding on to different parts of that elephant in order for you to get a full picture of what that elephant is. Well, I want to argue that it is the same with God. And so when we talk about uh, God as Father, Amen. We we are even though our liturgical language speaks about God in it, it, much exclusively through the language of of male uh, language, it is not to over associate that. Now, why is that important? Because I think we were talking about this with our men uh, a couple weeks ago. That if we are not careful, we will give ourselves too much pressure to be God, because we think God is a man. Hallelujah. And if you think God is a man, or if you think God is exclusively father, that's quite a burden for all of us, you know, mortals to carry. <laughs> so they say, man, well, how about this? It's a big burden for me to carry. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to be God. Amen. I'm certainly just trying to be faithful as a mortal human being with certain responsibilities. And so on today, I hope that we can uncover and lift up what some of these responsibilities look like in light of God's revelation to us as 
Father. The scripture of Romans chapter number five in the lectionary gives to us a wonderful account, a theological account. Uh, I think Bishop Noel Jones first said this when I heard it. He said that the Gospels uh, is God's story to us through narrative and uh, 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 Paul's text in Romans is the gospel through theology. It is the attempt to give us a theological description of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therein we read verses 1 through 5 of Romans chapter 5. The scripture says, therefore, since we are justified by faith. Anybody know what it means to be justified? To mean justified means that it is not because of your own doing. To be justified means that God has just stamped you with an approval. Man, it, it don't got nothing to do with you. God just says you are justified. Amen. No qualifications. Isn't it good to be justified by God? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you justified. You all right. God says you are justified. Therefore, we are justified by faith. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. My goodness. You know, you read scripture in your head and, you know, and it, it just kind of washes over you. Then you read it out loud. Then you'd be like, mm, this is some good stuff. Amen. We have peace with God through Jesus through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Give me a high five and tell them I got access. Uh, tell somebody else, that's why I'm standing. Amen. All right. Now, uh, and, and we'll keep reading because this is kind of where our, our, our sermon will kind of get much of its meat. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Mm. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to speak from the topic today, fathering at its best. Fathering at its best. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. I pray that you will hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Fathering at its best. As I stated uh, in part of my brief introduction here, uh, the, the role of fathering is one uh, that has all kinds of of, 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 of baggage uh, accompanied with it, mostly because uh, we are beginning to appreciate uh, the many ways in which the role of fathers often over associated with God can create all kinds of, of, of over determinations around how we experience both God and, dare I say, we experience the world. And, and there is indeed a reality among us that uh, to be a father is, 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 is one that, uh, particularly around these days, uh, don't always get as much uh, attention. You know, a Mother's Day, uh, you know, gets all kinds of, of accolades, amen, as it should, amen, because if it wasn't for mamas, amen, none of us would be here, amen. But father's got a role to play in this thing too, somebody say amen, right? Uh, aside from, amen, Mary, the mother of Jesus, amen, uh, somebody had to make a contribution, <laughs> somebody say amen, uh, to the creation of all of us in here. Now, even if the contribution is the full extent 
of fathers in some of our lives, it still goes without saying that the way God intended creation to function as it relates to the prop promulgation, the continued uh, uh, existence of creation, that we are indeed a people who are in need of fathers, of figures who are able to provide to us those kinds of uh, 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 characteristics, experiences, touches, if you will, that uh, will help round some of our rough edges out. Now, you know, it is, uh, you know, very interesting uh, uh, thing to, to be uh, experiencing a father at their worst. Uh, because uh, it, it can often leave lots of long-lasting impact, trauma, pain. And, 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 and many of us uh, have some of that working through our bodies and mind and spirit right now. Well, some of us is, is like, you know, fasting and praying through this sermon, like, Lord, just get Pastor Mike to the benediction. Because I'm over Father's Day. <laughs> but I also want you to struggle with how, for many of us who are men, and dare I say, uh, products of fathers that have been present or not very present, the ways in which that kind of cycle can continue to proliferate and create all kinds of vulnerabilities within ourselves and within our communities. That what fathering at its best ought to do is to help create spaces for healing and abundance in ways that cause you and I to be fully growing into our greatest possibility. I was being interviewed for uh, a book that came out and uh, they were asking me uh, about uh, liberation. And I said that liberation in my mind is about removing any obstacle that gets in the way of human flourishing and, 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 and helping us to appreciate that when God creates, God does not create with bondage in mind. Meaning God has no need for you and I to be bound. Amen. Amen. God wants you to be free. Amen. God wants us to be free. And, and so as I was thinking about uh, the text today and, and, and doing a little bit of uh, uh, jumping down the rabbit hole, I, I, I stumbled upon another text that I found to be particularly uh, unlocking for me as I and we deal with this Romans text. It's another Pauline reference, letter of Paul to the Thessalonian church, verse chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. I don't have it on the screen, I don't think, but uh, just, just listen to these words. Paul is describing his interaction with the church in uh, Thessalonica, and he says, as you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into God's own kingdom and glory. That at its best, fathering is about reminding us that we can be better than we are and we must be better than what we were. And I want to acknowledge that many of us who are fathers struggle with this historical legacy of what does it mean to contend with the notions of my father, both good or bad, and the reality of these children or others I've been tasked with stewarding, appreciating that I may be handing them to a future that is not yet determined. What does it mean to appreciate that that role must be one done with God as my, not just partner, but as my driver? 
that God is giving you and I an opportunity to live into God's unique and important design that says that you and I then must, as a father deals with their children, urge, encourage, and plead that you live a life worthy of God, the one who created you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God had a role and a plan for your life, and it is now our role to help father you into that best. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that the scriptures, I think, lift this up for us? In Romans chapter number five, I, 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 I'm compelled by several uh, ideas in here that I think can help us uh, wrestle with some of these both truths and challenges. The first role I think of fathering at its best is that fathers participate in sharing with children the glory of God. One of the most important roles for a father at its best is you and I, we must become some of the first explainers and teachers of the glory of God, both in the world and within that child. That to start off with this truth, as scripture says, that we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. You and I are partnering with God to share with those around us God's glory. Amen. That you, with your mouth and your actions, are sharing with those around you the glory of God. That if a child has no other teacher to tell them about the glory of God, that your role as a father must be to teach our children that there is someone greater than them. When I dedicate babies, you all see what we do by lifting up the, the young child and proclaiming uh, that we are giving this child back to the one who is greater than this child. Some of y'all may think we got that from Lion King. Amen. <laughs> but I remember the first time I saw that was actually in Roots. And, 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 and it goes to show you how, how, how important uh, it was for my father to sit us down and make us watch Roots. Because it became a concrete, burned image in my mind of the role of a father to commit himself to his child in a way that he is constantly giving his child back to God. The only one greater than his child. Do you know the kind of humility it takes in a hyper-masculine world where we are taught that we are all sufficient, that we are taught perhaps that we are indeed God? How humble it is to acknowledge to your child there is someone greater than me. And not only is that one greater than me, but it is my responsibility to be the first one in your life to demonstrate and model that you are great, but you are not greater than the creator. Uh, you know, what, what, what this has done for me and many of us is that it has forced us to continue to relate to a transcendent God in a way that reminds me and us that God's responsibility, as Jesus says, it is our Father's good pleasure to give to his children the kingdom of God, the benefits 
of life, the benefits of love, the benefits and the privileges of safety and security. And part of what I believe about our role, fathers, is that at its best, we become teachers of the transcendent God. But listen, we also become teachers that remind our children and those in our families that they reflect this great God. That there is something unique and special about their constitution as a human being. That even when the world seeks to tear away at their image and at their, their dignity and at their being, that, that we must instill in them so, I was going to say tough, but, but I, I want something more sophisticated, amen. Uh, but that may have to do. We, we must instill in them with, with such uh, a veracity and, 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 and such, such confidence that even when people attempt to tell them that they are not reflective of the glory of God, that we've convinced them that I am somebody because my God and my father and my mother and my whole community has told me so. You see, what I, I want you and I to appreciate today is that sharing the glory of God is both descriptive and declarative. You must describe to our or your child, to our children, that God's character, God's, God's ways, God's, 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 God's role in the world is thus and thus and thus. What does that force you and I to, to do? It means, number one, that we must know something about God ourselves. Amen. That, that, that we then as fathers, if we're going to live into fathering at its best, must be able to wrestle with God and the knowledge of God as it is laid before us. And because you and I can't know God exhaustively, how many of you know what you learn about God must be subject to change? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. No, I, 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 was, I was, I was, I was, I was reading uh, a couple, a couple of things over the years, and 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 I think Bishop Bishop Yvette Flunder, uh, who who um, we're trying to get to come preach here one day, man. I don't know if it's going to be this month or some month to come, but she she said something uh, so unique, and she said that one of the hardest things for me to do was to unlearn that which what that which I thought was true. Amen. One of the hardest things for me to do was to unlearn that which I thought was true. Franz Fanon has this fascinating kind of uh, framework around cognitive dissonance where, you know, he talks about you and I can hold on to a belief and be so convinced with that belief that even when we are told a different a set of evidences regarding that belief that counteract that belief, we will hold on to it and it will create cognitive dissonance. I want to argue that for many of us, we have a lot of cognitive dissonance about God because we have a hard time unlearning what we have been told to be true. It doesn't mean that you just throw everything out, but it means that you must model what does it mean to have a certain humility about the one who you are giving your child to that is greater than you and be comfortable living in that tension that, man, if this God is greater than me and my child, then maybe I have a lifelong of learning to do about this God. And how do I teach then those around me to live life in faith, knowing that, what I don't know does not discount my faith. As a matter of fact, it possibly helps me to live into that faith even the more. It is descriptive, but it is also declarative that you help to declare to your child that you are created in the image of God. And fathers, I want us to be one of these folk out here with children whether they're our children or not, whether we mentor in them, whether we just see them on the street, that we help them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt yes. that 
that they are created in the image of God. And that is without negotiation. Now, one of the great challenges, which goes to my next point in this, is that if we don't know that we're created in the image of God first, it's hard to lead folks to places we ourselves have not yet been. Uh, so, 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 so let me, let me, let me give you these first, first, first couple questions. Uh, what do your kids learn about God through your words and actions? Amen. And you know, it's, 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 it's a good question for all of us. We talk about fathers today, but all of us can wrestle with this question. Fathering at its best should teach us something about God. Amen. And hopefully it's not teaching us about what God is not like. You know, it's like, how did my daddy taught me this ain't about what God is like. But it should also help us, I believe, help clarify, give our families a concrete expression, similarly how mothers do, about the ways in which God seeks to make God's self known to us. And I, and I can testify about my dad all day long, about all the great things my dad taught me about God through his life. But I just don't have the time. But, but God, God gave us a great dad who taught us to fear God and love people and take care of your family and push through difficulty and don't make excuses. But to, but to trust that life will, will keep going if you keep living. Amen. Uh, second thing, do you teach your children they reflect God's glory? And I find that to be another important characteristic of fathering at its best. The second thing that I think the text lifts up for you and I, every father, every, every mentor, every man, every human being, person in this place today, I want you to get this truth. There's glory in your story. Fathering at its best teaches us that there's glory in your story story. I love this description of the text where it says that we boast in our sufferings. You know, this idea that you have something worth boasting about. Uh, we were at, uh, uh, Cherise uh, took us to, to go see Lecrae last night. And, and they're, 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 they're whole, they had their whole uh, 116 crew, uh, Romans 116, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and they call themselves the 116 crew, and so, so it was interesting because I can't remember which one of them because it was so many of them, amen, I just, I mean, I'm not a big hip-hop guy like that, I love Lecrae, but everybody else, I couldn't make out who they were and have what they were saying uh, most of the time, but I did appreciate this one thing about how, uh, you know, um, how uh, the, 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 I think it was Trip Lee or, or mean, mean, uh, Menio. Come on, was you there last night? No, you don't know. <laughs> we'll take you next time, right? Uh, how how Menio, one of them was saying that usually when you get on stage, you know, rappers are always boasting about their cars. And he's like, and I can't boast about mine because I only got two. One's a Volkswagen, the other one's a Honda, right? And he said, some are boasting about their women. He was like, and I can't, you know, you know boast about women because I only have one. That's my wife. And, and then he said, uh, some get on stage as rappers and boast about their money. And he was like, and if you looked at my bank account, you would definitely come to believe there's nothing to boast about <laughs> in my account. Uh, but he then started to talk about what he does boast about, and, and, and he started to talk about his story. And, and, and I felt like it was a wonderful kind of resonance with this particular part of the passage that many of us downplay our journey because of shame. Particularly when we start talking about the scriptures' descriptions. We boast in our sufferings. But many of us don't boast or share or talk about our sufferings even with our own families because we are put into such shame about our mistakes and we don't realize that our shame does not illuminate for our families those generational cycles that must be broken. 
It's a terrible thing to wake up one day not clear about why you have these inclinations that are four generations deep in your family. Mm -hmm. and you go, Man, why, am I, why am I this way? Then you start to talk to your probably grandma. You ain't even talk to your mama because your mama's like, mom's the word. But you know, when, when, you, when you get older, I found older folk just, they, they, they so old, they don't care about the secrets no more. They're like, it don't matter. We still here. What, 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 what I'm ashamed, <laughs> what I'm ashamed about. <laughs> if, 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 this, if this thing didn't help me, we'd be dead already. Somebody say amen, right? So, you know, you ought to find you an older person in your family, a matriarch, a patriarch, a big mama, someone that, you know, just talk real slow and groan in between each word. Like, mm, baby, I just want you to know Papa was a rolling stone. You know, you find somebody who can describe to you the sufferings of your family. The scripture says we boast in our sufferings. Why? Because your sufferings do not necessarily lead you to death. The scripture says that sufferings produce endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them there's glory in your story. Amen. You, you must understand that suffering that you have endured as both a father or a son or a daughter or a child, although it's been difficult, it has also contributed to your glory. How are you transparent about your struggles, your sufferings? Appropriately, I might add, because appropriateness is important. But still yet, when we were young, my father used to tell us all of our generational challenges. My dad told us that we had incest and abuse in our family. So he would tell us, if you feel these urges, you must confront them. You just, I'm just exactly how my dad talked. You know, his voice would confront them. <laughs> so y'all don't know my dad. He's back there. My dad just grinned. He just got, but back in the day, my dad was quite uh, vociferous. Amen. He would tell us when we went to stay at people's homes, even our own family members. You watch out for your cousins and uncles and aunts. <laughs> you just, just, just watch out now because this stuff is in our family. We sitting there like, I wonder what daddy's talking about. We didn't know, but dad taught us about our show. He told us, our families have alcoholism. Amen. It's in our family. So I still don't drink because I'm afraid of that one. Amen. <laughs> I got enough vices without an extra one. Amen. He told us that we liked women. Talking about the men. Womanizers. High drives. Sex drive. So he said, sons. <laughs> My dad disclosed his struggles to us. And then the operative thing was, it's your job, our job, to break these cycles. The transparency in your suffering help produce the endurance necessary for healing. Sufferings produce endurance. You and I 
must appreciate that to endure suffering, endure trauma, only happens through certain practices that facilitate our healing and restoration. These things don't happen by you clicking your heels three times. Lord, I, I just, I, you my genie, and I'm going to rub this thing and get three wishes. How many know it don't work like that? Amen. God, God, God wants you and I to do some work of healing ourselves. And that's righteous work. That's good work. God wants you to be healed. God wants you to know that at its best, fathering is helping to facilitate healing of both yourself and your family. And you must know that God has an investment in your healing. God does not want you or I to repeat the kind of cycles that have created fractured human beings. God wants us to be well. God wants us to be whole. God wants us to be healed. But the healing only happens through you enduring in practices that create wholeness. And there are some of these spiritual practices and some of these practices that may not be necessarily spiritual, but they still are of the spirit. We have therapy. How many know those practices? If you get, get, get a good therapist, Someone who believes in the power of the greater one and the power of the one in you, that then you can get a far way down the road to some healing. Some of these practices mean that you got to sit in some relationships with other individuals and allow your life to be a bit more of an open book. Because some of us, uh huh. We, 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 we practice, we have perfected the art of deception. And I, I'm one of these folk, you know, uh, the, you know, living as a minister for these many years, you, you, you kind of, you kind of appreciate that some things you just got to like fake it till you make it. There are some Sundays up here, if, if y'all don't know what I be struggling with, but I have a responsibility in this broken vessel to proclaim to you the hope of our glory but i'm around some folk who i can tell the truth to and they can tell the truth to me that is a process of our healing what does it mean for you to get into some relations with some men some folk where you can be honest with and they can be honest with you and you they can you can try to blow smoke up their butt but they realize no that sounded like a little bit of mm, this is smelly I smell some things. Hello, somebody. Produces endurance. Listen, going through the process of healing, endurance produces character. What you think about this now? You started out as suffering. You engaged in practices that created enough endurance for you to begin your journey of healing. And the more you keep going, the healing produces character. Oh, have mercy. They say character is who you are when no one else is watching. Character are those ways that you describe, you are described and others describe you. When we talk about the characteristics of God, we say that God is love and God is just and God is, 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 is righteous and God is, is powerful and God is, 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 is good. Amen. We, 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 we describe the characteristics of God by what God does. Amen. You and I often have character flaws and deficiencies because the healing and the restoration is still in process. You are not a finished product. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you are not finished yet. I just want you to know that. There's, there's a lot more that God is wanting to do. That's good news. Now, I hope you ain't thinking about you hating on me. No, I'm just giving you some good news. There's more to you than who you are today. There's more for you to learn and grow and become. 
happen. God forbid you. I don't care how old you are. You, you can be old as dirt. You still got some more work to do, more growing to do. Huh? You compare your own age with eternity. How many know there's still a long way to go? Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm excited that, that when I keep enduring through my struggle and my trial, God begins to produce character in me. God begins to help me to be described differently by what I do. Man, you know, folks be like, oh, you know, what I do is not who I am. <laughs> that may be true sometimes. <laughs> but if you lie all the time, you're just a liar. Donald Trump, you know, you, 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 if, if you ask him a question three times and you get a different answer every time, that's why he won't go under, you know, oath. Because they, they'll know he'll just, he'll just perjure himself. Man, what's your name, Donald? What's your name? Don, I don't know. If you lie, you just a liar. So in our family systems and structures and histories, even though some of our practices may be foul, the endurance helps to transform us and create more character. Why is that important? Because your character helps to influence your children, your families. If you have good character, better character, improving character, our families will be producing in a different kind of way. Lord, I'm on these points way too long, but, but, but last thing, character produces hope. <sighs> hope. Hope is the expression of the better. My dad told us to break these cycles my dad also held up that I want you all to be better than me. The character, knowing the struggles, but the character produced by the endurance creates momentum for a better you, a better child, a better family. And could it be that one of your greatest contributions of your story, particularly the glory in it, is that you are producing hope which cannot disappoint. You may outgrow some of the aspects and elements of your family's history, struggle, ideas, et cetera. But that is the hope. Any good parent wants their child to be better than them. Create the momentum for the concrete expression of hope. That's fathering at its best. That my responsibility is to put enough momentum, wind beneath your wings through the sufferings that I had to endure, the journey of endurance I had to undergo, the, 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 the character that was produced out of that journey, all of that should be momentum for our fathering at best to produce hope, to create the flame of possibility in the eyes of our children and loved ones. Then Paul finishes his theological description of our justification and our life with God by saying, God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Fathers, God has poured out love into your heart in ways that you are now allowed to pour it out into the hearts of others. Sometimes, because we've been socialized in different kinds of ways, 
that it's hard for men to give love because we have not always received love. But I have wonderful memories of my dad telling us he loved us. Sometimes my dad would get emotional and he would hold us and cry. Crying, saying, I love you, son. Well, I don't know what my dad was talking about. I was like, man, what's, what's wrong with daddy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You know, I'm thinking this in my mind. I, you know, you know, you know, because I was still afraid of my dad to be like, "Daddy, what's wrong with you?" And I never told that to my dad. To probably when I got thirty or something, "Daddy, what's wrong with you, Dad?" Like before they were just kind of thinking it in my mind, kind of like Smokey, you know. Uh, <laughs> when he leaves, I do, I do talk, you know, type situation. <laughs> but then when I got my own children and I began to hold them. There's just something about pouring out the love on those whom you're called to love as a, an extension of the love God has poured out in you. All of us in here, I want you to know God has poured out love in your heart. Listen to me for this point. God has poured out love in your heart. Whether you get it from someone else or not, God has given you an outpour of God's love. Live your life pouring that love into someone else. <laughs> Pour out God's love. Given to you through the Holy Spirit. So again, you can't even take credit for it. You have to realize, man, this is, this is all a gift from God. And I'm to pass this gift along. God's love makes all of this possible. And on this Father's Day, my hope and prayer is that fathering at its best is us pouring out this love that God has given to us onto others, your children, your partner, your family, your community. That's what it is at its best. It's not trying to be, you know, a tyrant, dictator. Uh, you know, Cornel West, he said it, uh, you know, popularized the, the, fr the phrase, uh, just as what love looks in public. But then he said, love, no, tenderness is what love looks like in private. So what does it mean for us as fathers? Dare I say all of us, but again, Father's Day, I'm, I'm just trying to give fathers, give y'all uh, some special attention. What does it mean for the love of God poured out in our hearts to come up in our private spaces as tenderness. God, help me to be tender with myself. It's hard being particularly a black man in this season where threats are 360 and then internal. It's hard being a man when we've been socialized to only show up in the world with force, rigidity, violence, certainty, in a world that is, if not anything else, uncertain. So be tender with yourself as you go through the journey of learning how to love yourself and others. Be gentle with yourself as you make amends for some of the harm you may have caused. Find you some folk who can help you tenderly Walk through those spaces without destroying yourself. But also remember, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not disappoint. Break some cycles. Let's do fathering at its best. Come on, stand to your feet, everyone, and let's spend a few moments in prayer. God, I want to thank you for the person I'm touching today. On this day when we certainly celebrate and acknowledge 
the wonderful roles that fathers play in our life. I pray that these truths and challenges, God, will resonate with all of us in many different kinds of ways. May we know and hope and believe and remember that there is great possibility, great power and promise in the hand that I am holding. May they know today, God, that they are created in the image of the uncreated one. They are created in the image of the eternal, created in the image of the creator, that there is a divine stamp of dignity and power and approval within their body, their person. As I touch them, God, I pray they may know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is much love and peace and joy that exist in their life and in their future. And so I pray that you'll give them what they need, God. I pray that if healing and restoration needs to take place in this family of origin, in their family of, of current contemporary structures, God, I pray that the healing, the, 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 the glory in their story will shine through in ways that help them to see, hallelujah, that it was not all for naught, that their greatest struggle and trial was producing some other material that will be a blessing to their family and to their progeny and to their community, that there was a glory in that story that shines bright the truth of your redemptive power May it produce character in them, Lord God, a, a, a level of integrity, a level of human flourishing, God, a level of salvation and strength. And certainly, God, may they know that love grounds them. May they know that love centers them and helps them to become better than who they are. The love that you poured out on us love as a force, love as a shaper of our most internal parts. Through the power of your spirit, Lord, let your love work on us. May it work on them. May we have fathering happening at its best in our families and in our communities. Lift your hands right where you're standing. And so God, it's me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need your strength, I need your power, I need your help, I need your love, I need your anointing, I need your spirit. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to give me what I need to be faithful in this season. I need you, God, to give me what I must have to endure and to get the character and the hope that is a result of my suffering and struggle. I need you, God, to help me to be, God, better in my family, in my relationships. Help me to show up better in my community. Help me to show up better and more faithful, God, in every part of my life and may it be an outgrowth of the love that you poured out upon me. Help me, Lord, to love my father. Help me to love my grandfather. Help me to love my children. Help me to love my wife. Help me to love my partner. Help me to love those whom you placed around me, God, so I can be faithful and I can be who you've called me to be and be that at its best. And I know that your spirit is right alongside helping me. So fill me with your spirit. Fill me up and let it overflow. God, let it overflow until I can't have any more room to, Lord, have anything else. Lord, that when I show up in classrooms and on the job and in the neighborhoods, may the love of God that has been poured out, may it flow freely into the lives of others. And we'll say, thank you, God. We'll say, thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them there's glory in your story. 
Come on, tell them that there's glory in your story. 